in innovating work and who also have the ability to communicate to the general public, that's us, the excitement and significance of their work and of science in general. We are very pleased to have as today's Della Pietra lecturer, Professor Andre Linda from Stanford University. Professor Linda is the Harold Trapp Fias Professor of Physics at Stanford University. He's one of the main authors of, of the inflationary universe theory, as well as the theory of eternal inflation and the inflationary multiverse. multiverse. He received his Bachelor of Science degree from Moscow State University, and in 1975, he received his PhD from the Lebedev Physics. You want to say it? Thank you. I have some. Never mind. Uh, Institute in Moscow. He has worked at CERN, the Centre Européen de Recherche Nucléaire. Uh, since 1989, and he's been a professor of physics at Stanford since 1990. He has won many, many international prizes. In 2002, he was awarded the Dirac Medal, along with Alan Guth of MIT and Paul Steinhardt of Princeton University, for his work on inflation. In 2004, he received, along with Alan Guth, the Gruber uh, Cosmology Prize for the Development of Inflationary Cosmology. He is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. The title of his talk today is Universe or Multiverse. Please welcome Professor Linda. Thanks a lot for this kind of introduction. And I'm very honored to be here and I'm also very pleased to be here and to see some of my very old friends whom we, well, we know, uh, some of us know each other for like 30 years or something. So it, it's, it's a great pleasure. And also, I must say that I'm a bit scared. And I, I am a bit scared because uh, I had two strange incidents on my way uh, to this place. First, the taxi driver who took me from Stanford to San Francisco it was like 40 minutes ride, and all the way he asked me all kind of questions about the multiverse. <laughs> <laughs> and then whether it is possible experimentally to confirm superstring theory or it is going <laughs> to, to remain uh, well, just a nice story. And so it was one thing. And then after that, my <laughs> plane was delayed for three hours at San Francisco airport, and I arrived to the airport to New York at about one o'clock at night, but the taxi was waiting me there, and the, a lady who was waiting me, she was driving me here for about an hour. For about an hour, she complained that this is such a wonderful center, and I'm driving here, such wonderful people around, and I still have these problems. I'm still learning this quantum mechanics. It's so complicated. <laughs> My God, what is going on? <laughs> so, so uh, I'm deeply impressed and, uh, okay. <laughs> okay, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I, since you like this one, I cannot, uh, I cannot uh, even continue going. I, I must remember some other story. When I was at this, how you pronounce the name of the institution in French, uh, at, 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 at CERN, I was flying for the uh, well, first time in, in many years to the United States. I was asked by American uh, Physical Society to give an opening talk on quantum cosmology at their session. And I was uh, sitting and preparing my uh, slides for the talk in the airplane. And some woman passing by asked a person sitting near me, not me, are you a cosmologist? And she asked it because the person was reading the book by Stephen Hawking. <laughs> and I asked him, uh, and he said no. And I asked him, so what is your profession? And he told me, I'm an economist. I study economy of Japan. And he continued, 
uh, reading. And I ask him then, interested, is it actually easy for you to understand what is there? Because uh, it's quite a complicated and challenging book in some parts. And he said, no, no, it's very easy. I can easily explain it to you. <laughs> so <laughs> that just continues. <clears throat> anyway, so let's, let's start with what was before uh, the Big Bang and all of these questions which bother people for so many years. Um, inflationary cosmology uh, emerged as an attempt to answer some questions which for many years seemed almost uh, metaphysical. And that's why people thought that they are not obliged even, uh, what, what is the question? Okay. Uh, they, they are not obliged even to give answers because physicists are not supposed to spend their time uh, answering metaphysical questions. Like for example, what was before the Big Bang? Uh, uh, I was learning this in Russia. There was the textbook by Landau and Lifshitz in which they said that some people are interested in what happened before the Big Bang, but the solutions of the Einstein equation, uh, equations cannot be continued to the negative time, and therefore it does not make any sense to ask what happened before the Big Bang. And so, well, nevertheless, so many years people continue asking. So we also are uh, still interested in that. Why is our universe so hom homogeneous, so uniform? We thought that, what is the question? Actually, it is not that uniform, because if you look around, you see lots of galaxies, stars, planets. So there are very important non-uniformities around us. Um, but if you look at the scale, which is much, much larger than the size of our galaxy, at the scale which is largest, with, which we can see at the telescope, then the matter to the right of us and to the left of us is distributed uh, approximately uniformity with accuracy um, better than one in 10,000. So somehow the universe was created almost uniform. What is, the, what is the matter with this? And of course this question was bothering people for a long time ago and they came with the answer called cosmological principle. Cosmological principle uh, sound like that. The uniform is, uni uh, sorry, the universe is universe is uniform because of the cosmological principle. And uh, I first uh, made some kind of jokes, like people who do not have good ideas, they sometimes have principles. But then, <laughs> <laughs> but then I stopped doing it when I learned that uh, two men used this principle. And what first was Newton and then Albert Einstein. So but <clears throat> what we learned actually is how to explain why the universe is uniform without using principles per se. In fact, if you use a principle, then why the universe is not perfectly uniform? Because if you just say that the universe must be uniform because it's a principle, then what's about galaxies? Galaxies are inhomogeneities, non-uniformities. So you cannot say that the universe must be uniform, and then you have these things around. It's like the person who takes small bribe cannot be considered a man of principle just because the, uh, the bribes are small. So here is a small inhomogeneity as these galaxies, but uh, they break the law. Why it is isotropic? It's a bit more difficult to explain, but it's like that. The universe could be, in, well, could be homogeneous, but homogeneous like in this direction and in that direction it could be elongated like, uh, well, a, a big uh, balloon like that, okay, like a cucumber. And somehow people associate the spherical form with the universe. It's the same in all directions. So actually, it is a problem why the universe is actually isotropic. Why all of its parts start expanding simultaneously? What do I mean by the problem? Well, suppose that the universe is infinite, okay? Then it starts expansion, as we say, at the moment of the Big Bang, time equal to zero. So the person here starts seeing the universe start expanding, and the person here also sees the universe begins expanding. But who gave the signal? This guy could not tell this other guy that now it's time to start expanding. I am starting, so let's go together. Well, they cannot do it because it takes time for them to communicate, which is a distance divided by speed of light. So they could not synchronize expansion of the universe. 
So the universe could start expanding simultaneously because of what? So I was a student, remember, I was reading it, I had a flu, I was in my bed, I was reading some science popular magazine explaining the Big Bang story, and I thought, oh my god, I do not understand it, probably I'm ill. I do not understand it. Why? How it could be possible? Probably when I will be older, I go to the university and I ask my professors why the universe started its expansion simultaneously. And when I get older, I came to the university and it appeared that professors did not know that the question exists. So that's uh, another, another part. Why the universe is so flat? Uh, well, what do I mean? Models describing the universe can describe closed universe which is compact and which has geometry such that when you have two parallel lines, like two parallel beams of light, it goes and it converges at some point. Just like when you have an Earth and you have two parallel lines at the equator, they meet each other at the South Pole and at the North Pole. Okay? So then why parallel lines in our universe do not intersect? Nobody has ever seen them intersect. So it looks like, oh, OK, so why not? Uh, an observation. If you start with a generic uh, universe in, in the beginning, at the, well, very large density when the Big Bang happened, okay, and you want the, the universe to be as flat as it is now, so it's kind of flattish, okay, then you must fine tune this flatness in the original universe with accuracy 10 to the minus 60, okay? So it's just a miracle. Many, many miracles to explain. Our universe from the very beginning was flat. So if Creed was supposed to be right from the very beginning, for whatever reason, uh, these parallel lines were supposed not to be, par uh, uh, supposed to be parallel. In fact, this can be shown to be equivalent to the following question. Why there are so many people in this auditorium, okay? The answer is like trivial. Okay, so there, somebody comes, a very nice city, good university, and well, there are some people who sponsored the lecture. And so many people came to, to the lecture. But why there are so many people uh, around in New York? Well, New York is a big city in the part of the United States. There are many people in the United States. Some live in New York, some close. Okay. Why there are so many people on the Earth? Or oh, in fact, Earth is just one of the planets and there are lots of planets we have discovered right now, a few hundreds of them. So some of them uh, hospital to life, and some of them will uh, live on the Earth, and uh, some people came to the talk. Why there are so many planets? Actually, in our own galaxy, there are 10 to the 11 stars. And do you know how many galaxies are in our part of the universe, which we see approximately 10 to the 11 galaxies? So that's why you have lots of galaxies, lots of stars, lots of planets, and some of the people came to, uh, to the talk. Um, <laughs> but why there are so many galaxies in our universe? And the answer is, but the universe is big. <laughs> and then the kid asked, Father, but why the universe is big? And the answer is, shut up, the universe. <laughs> it's the universe. <laughs> The question is actually uh, absolutely non-trivial. If you take normal Big Bang theory, and if you come with the idea what is the natural number of elementary particles which a closed universe could contain, natural number, just well, build something from the natural units of length, whatever, the natural number is one elementary particle, or maybe 10 elementary particles. But right now, we observe in the part of the universe which we see, we observe about 10 to the degree 88 elementary particles. So from expectations to reality, there is a big gap, 10 to the 88 orders of magnitude, and we want to explain it. So all of this, nevertheless, was considered to be almost uh, like, you are not obliged to answer this question. This is metaphysics. But what happened? The first question, we still don't know the answer. These questions are answered by inflationary theory. This set of questions, which I didn't even mention here, is, uh, possible answers to these questions are given either by inflation or by inflation in combination of stri with string theory. We are not absolutely sure 
that we are uh, here on the right track, but it at least very suggestive that maybe we are up to something. So that's why I'm talking about inflationary cosmology here. Uh, still another way of understanding what we are, why the standard Big Bang Theory had problems. If we look at the total amount of matter in the universe right now, we can concentrate only on the total number of energy in radiations, just photons. Experimental fact, in the part of the universe which we observe right now experimentally, it's approximately 10 to the 53 grams of energy in radiation, okay? Now, the universe previously was smaller when it emerged from a Planckian density, just the moment which is usually associated with the Big Bang. So these photons which exist right now, they had much shorter wavelength previously because when the universe expands, the wavelengths grow. When we play the movie back, we see these photons had very small wavelengths. And if we estimate the total amount of energy these photons had at that time is 10 to the 85 grams. And by the way, you can be puzzled anyway, because when I say mass and energy uh, in the same sentence, it's just the same Einstein trick. Whatever is mass, you can recalculate it m equal to whatever. A energy is equal to mc squared. Okay, so you can recalculate energy and mass. So uh, and you may be surprised, how is that, that in the early universe you have this energy and now it has only this energy. The thing is that during expansion, the energy is not conserved. Because when the universe expands, these photons make their work on expanding the universe. So the standard energy conservation, which is a part of, okay, it should be uh, formulated carefully. Because the energy of matter, it's not the whole thing. You must take into account also energy of gravity. Uh, the, uh, so they spend uh, the energy by expanding, but so you must start with this number. And then you may wonder who gave you this number. So how is that? There was a Big Bang. Before the Big Bang, you had nothing. After the Big Bang, you suddenly have 10 to the 85 grams of matter, at least, ignoring everything but radiation, ignoring normal matter. Okay, 10 to the 85 grams from what kind of pocket? And then this part must be very, very uniform with accuracy one in 10 in 100,000, so it's very improbable to get it. So when you think about it, the idea that who could do it, it's just, well, maybe God could do it. Because I do not have any better idea except, uh, well, except inflation. <laughs> okay. So what we learned is that it's potentially possible to get all of this matter and to explain why it is uniform and how it is possible to create everything around without violating of energy conservation laws, create everything from less than one milligram of matter. So that is, again, if somebody would come to me, like maybe 30, let me be more exact, exact 32 years ago, if somebody would come to me with something like that, that I know how to create all the universe from less than one milligram of matter, and I know how to create galaxies from quantum fluctuations, and I would say to this person, well, go home, and tomorrow when you're not drunk, come again, and we'll continue discussion. <laughs> but that's what we are talking for the last 30 years. We're talking about this. So this is sound strange, and let me introduce it a little. So the first model of inflationary type was actually invented uh, by Alexei Starobinsky in 1980 uh, in Moscow. He uh, invented the theory which was a bit complicated. It is based on the Einstein gravity with some quantum corrections, uh, well, some trace anomaly contribution. It was a pretty complicated story. And he did not have a good intuitive explanation why he would even need to do it. So the problem, the uh, scenario was a bit challenging, but interestingly, potentially it worked. <coughs> then Alan Guth, um, he came with a theory which was very, very simple, and he was able to explain what kind of problems it potentially can solve. So uh, everything was great about his paper. It was em emotionally charged and very, very clear. The only bad thing about it was that it didn't work. So uh, 
Um, and, and then he, uh, a year later, he had written a paper about 100 pages long, where he proven that his theory cannot be improved. So all of these uh, worked not very well. But fortunately, at that time, mail from United States to Russia worked with a very, very large delay. It came to our foreign secretary, and it was laying on his uh, well, uh, sofa for about a few months. And he would come and show you notes and say, did I have any mail? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so I received this preprint uh, after I already improved the model. And this was something which uh, I called new inflationary scenario. And then I suggested some other scenario, which is simpler, and then some other version. And then many other were proposed. So let me tell you about the simplest one, which I proposed, uh, well, two years later. Um, so this is the theory, which for explaining it, it requires to explain uh, the concept of scale of field. Okay? So that's a bit challenging, even though it's a very simple field. But the simplicity makes it uh, very non-intuitive. So I spent two years walking my dog in a nearby forest before I really could uh, understand the concept. And after that, that's what I'm doing all of my life. I'm using this knowledge. So my dog helped me. Um, so suppose that you have this voltage, the, this 110 volt in the socket. But actually, you need two. You need to have 110 and 0. If you have just 110 all over the room, then you would not notice it. It will be like a normal vacuum state. It's just empty room. You do not feel anything. Yeah, OK? So it's 110. If you are in Russia, if you are surrounded by 220 or any other country in Europe, also if it were just 100, 220, you do not care. There is no electricity. If you have this 110 and 0, then uh, don't touch it because you will be shocked. I know it. I was. OK? So uh, the difference of potential is something that works. But just potential makes it like another vacuum state. Uh, experimental proof. Um, have you ever seen these birds on the high voltage lines? 10,000 volts sound like that. OK? So have you ever seen sitting there and nothing happens to them? OK? So 10,000 volts, they do not care. It's like uh, normal. Have you ever seen the birds with one uh, arm on one uh, line on another? Yeah. OK. They just got fired. <clears throat> so they evolutionarily disappeared. Um, <laughs> now, so what, what does it mean? If you are surrounded by something like that, which is very, very uniform, you may think that you are in a vacuum state. You will not notice it, but you will notice if there is some difference. So scale of field is very similar to that. For example, many people who are from physics department, they know that they are right now surrounded by a uniform scale of field, Higgs field, which gives every particle in their body mass. If not for this Higgs field, all of you will have zero mass. You will be flying with the speed of, uh, speed of light uh, while well, losing your identity on the way. Um, but thanks to this scale of field, you can walk and sit and listen. And you nevertheless, when you, you are not thinking about it like you are not in a vacuum, because yeah, there is no scale of field here. Okay? So you appreciate, you think about it like another vacuum state. So this is some step towards understanding what scale field is. If scale field is just a constant, then, it is scale, uh, th then it's like another vacuum state. If it moves, well, then it's not exactly a uh, uh, vacuum state. If it moves slowly there, though, so it's almost like a vacuum state. And here is the reason why I want to use this concept. Not only because it was also in the paper by Alan Guth, but I wanted to give an explanation, an intuitive explanation, what we are aiming at. Einstein equations, which tell you how fast the universe expands. One of them, uh, oh, you have a real joke here. <laughs> OK. 
<laughs> you can kill the enemy. So, <laughs> so it's, uh, this is what is called the scale factor of the universe. Scale factor is not really size, because if the universe is infinite, so what is the size? But if you have two galaxies, and you measure the distance, you call this scale. How large is the scale? And if you put it like a dot, meaning velocity. This velocity with which the scale changes. And then you divide it by the distance between galaxies. And this is what is called Hubble constant. So Hubble constant is velocity uh, with which galaxies are running away from each other, divided by the distance between galaxies. Now, Einstein equation, one of them, for the flat universe um, is this. So this quantity, Hubble constant squared, which is not really constant, it changes. Uh, it is proportional. Let me put here the sign of proportionality. I do not care about the coefficient. It's proportional to the density of the matter in the universe. So now think about it like that. You have a, oops, yeah, you have a box. So easy. Okay, you have a box of, of uh, uh, meter size. Okay, then you expand box twice. Volume grows eight times. If you have normal matter inside, then normal matter, density of matter, drops down eight times. Okay? If it is relativistic matter, then photons like, for example, then it actually drops down 16 times because the total number of photons is the same, volume is eight times bigger, but also the energy of the photons because of the expansion, energy of the photon is getting redshifted, so it becomes smaller, so it's 16 times smaller. The point is this, this thing is rapidly dropping down. And because it drops down when the universe is expanding, expansion may start with a bang, but this bang is not really big, because once the universe starts expanding, this row very rapidly becomes small, and so the speed of expansion slows down. Desire of inflationary theory is to get something which would not decrease that fast. And what could be this something? So here is an idea, and this will sound like cheating, and deeply it is cheating, but it will explain what you are going to see right now in a different language. So suppose instead of, well, this normal matter, like candies in the box, instead of that, I have heavy nothing, okay? Heavy nothing. Some vacuum which has non-zero energy. And this is not a science fiction. This is what actually people have discovered in 98 right now. Our universe is filled with not very energetic, but our vacuum has this non-zero energy density. So suppose you have a box filled with this heavy nothing, and you expand this box twice. So volume grows eight times, okay? What happened inside? Nothing happens because it's, well, it was nothing, it is still nothing, but its energy density remains the same. So the total energy inside the box actually have grown eight times when the box was expanding. It looks very silly, it looks like cheating, it is not, okay? So what I'm saying is that if you have some example of something which is not depleted by expansion of the universe, you can do a very interesting thing with it. What is interesting about it? Well, this is the simplest differential equations ever, simplest one. And the solution of this, even I can find, uh, and the solution is that uh, this factor A depends exponentially on time. So the universe, if it can exist in the regime with something like almost vacuum, Okay, and the universe expands, then the universe has a possibility of expanding exponentially fast. Exponentially fast is real fast. Okay, as compared to just Big Bang, where it expands fast in the beginning and then it slows down. So this is what is called inflation, and let me show you how it actually happens. So first of all, this is the simplest inflationary model, and this is energy of the scale of field in this case. This energy of the scale of field is not constant. The scale of field can change. It can roll down to the minimum of its energy. 
I play with a model which has the simplest possible energy of the scale of field, like energy of harmonic oscillator. For harmonic oscillator, energy of oscillator is proportional to the square of extension of the uh, oscillator from our equilibrium. So I consider the simplest model of the scale of field where it's vacuum if it does not move, but it wants to move, and its energy is quadratic with respect to scale of field. So now let's assume that the scale of field initially was large, and let us look at the equations. This is a popular lecture. So don't be scared. I'm not going to solve this equation, uh, force you to follow me. <clears throat> I am just pointing at them. So this is Hubble constant. This is Hubble constant. This is the energy of the scale of field. This is equation of motion for the scale of field. Ignore for a second this term. So this is like acceleration of the scale of field. And that's the mass of the scale of field. Uh, I'm just showing you this. Actually, if you know how to derive it, it's very, very simple. Okay? So it's just a question whether I am at the level of uh, philosophy, telling you something about almost vacuum, and then you leave the room in mistrust. Okay? Or I will show you, guess what? These are solutions, these are equations which we actually solved and checked that they give you a desirable regime. So these are equations, and these, these two terms are usual. The equation for the normal harmonic oscillator is very similar. This is proportional to this. This is like a returning force. This term is a bit unusual. This happens when you have harmonic oscillator and you put it into a viscous liquid. And then there is force which is proportional to velocity of, uh, of the moving body. So when you put a pendulum into viscous liquid, instead of oscillating like that, it will oscillate and will stop. Or if the liquid is very visc viscous, then what you have something which is called overdumped oscillation. That means the pendulum will move there very, very, very slowly and just move there. And there will be no oscillation. Okay? So let's see what is this term. This, uh, this, this is a friction. Now the, there is an anal analogy of this friction in the early universe, if you write down equation for the scale field accurately, taking into account that the universe is curved, then you get this extra term in the equation of motion for the scale field. Otherwise, it would be just normal oscillator. So this term shows that the friction term for the field phi is proportional to Hubble constant, meaning when the universe expands very, very fast, a very large friction. If you have very large friction, then for a long time, scale of field remains almost constant, moves down very slowly. If the scale of field remains almost constant, then this thing remains almost constant, and then I have this exponential solution. That's all. So all of these uh, discussions, they were helpful to understand the direction in which I'm going to go but we are just slightly modifying this direction. This is honest to God equations. Almost honest. I dropped some terms which disappear themselves if the universe enters the regime of exponential expansion. Then these terms very rapidly become exponentially small. So trust me, people wanted to find out any mistakes in solving these equations because it's kind of, well, too, too good to be true, you know, uh, things which were coming to the, too good to be true. So if you kill this thing, then you become famous. So people tried to uh, find an error in this kind of reasoning, but the reasoning was very simple, uh, and I just told you the reason. Large scale field fire, large Hubble, large friction, field moves slowly, exponential expansion. But now, eventually, however, this field moves down and its energy drops down. And therefore, Hubble constant slowly, according to the equation, slowly becomes small. And if it becomes small, then this friction term becomes small. If friction term becomes small, pendulum starts oscillating. So then the full regime is the following. First, you have almost constant scale of field, almost exponential expansion, slowly changing exponent. So it's quasi-exponential. Then the Hubble constant becomes small, 
and then it starts oscillating. When scalar field oscillates by its oscillations, it quantum creates elementary particles. These elementary particles, they interact with each other and the universe becomes hot, come to a state of thermal equilibrium. And that is the moment, starting from which standard Big Bang story start working well. So what we did, we took standard Big Bang story and added to it an initial stage, okay? This was initial stage. So why would we need to add this stage to it? Because if we take even tiny, tiny universe, during this stage, in the simplest models, the universe grows like that. This is a model-dependent number. It is not universally true. It depends on the model. But let's just play the game of numbers. So let's take some very smallish number. I really do not care what I write here. One centimeter, for example. Or maybe I write 10 to the minus uh, 33 centimeters, which is the Planckian length. Smaller than that, nobody could well write anything sensible. So let me do this. And let me multiply it by 10 to the degree 10 to the degree 10, approximately, which is the number which I'm writing. And guess what? The answer will be 10 to the degree 10 to the degree 10 centimeters, because this one would not even show up here. It, it really does not matter in which units you measure the size of the universe. The universe just becomes so large. Okay? Once it becomes so large, even if you start with a sphere, over the cucumber, the shape of it becomes irrelevant later because it just becomes flat. So you living on the shape of this expanding balloon, and this uh, balloon becomes flat, and that solves all of the pro or many of the problems which I mentioned. Like, for example, why the universe started expanding simultaneously in all places? Well, because we live right now, we see the part of the universe only of a size 10 to the 28 centimeters. Where this number came, it's the age of the universe multiplied by speed of light. That's what we see. This is a tiny, tiny fraction of this cosmic balloon. We see only this part. And on this part, parallel lines do not intersect. So we now know why Euclid was right. It was very easy. We know why Euclid was right. Why the universe is uniform? Think about it. You take uh, Everest the highest mountain on Earth, you expand it by this number of times, you get a flat place. Nobody would go with a back sack uh, to, well, to go to the top of it. It will be a very, very dull place. So what inflation does, it stretches everything and removes out of our part of the universe any previously existing inhomogeneities. So we're solving problem of in inhomogeneity. And also isotropy, because for you, it really does not matter. It's flat in this direction, it's flat in this direction. Okay, so that's how it works. Uh, so that's the idea. You have this tiny universe, and by the way, the tiny universe I may start with, indeed, the smallest one with the Planckian size, it would have Planckian mass, which is 10 to the minus 5 grams. And then after approximately 10 to the minus 30 seconds. So it's a billions of a billions of a billions of whatever. Second, you get this. And again, it, oh yeah, uh, it's a bit bright here, so you do not see part of it. But yes, it's 10 to the degree whatever. It does not really matter what the number is, and it does not really matter in which units, in any units, in miles or in centimeters. It's like that. Okay? So this is the idea of inflationary cosmology. Now, uh, I started with a red balloon because I came from Soviet Union. Uh, but then uh, in the US they have a similar idea except for it was black. Uh, Henry Ford famously said that any customer have a car painted, any color that they want, as long as it's black. Okay, so people wanted everything to be the same everywhere that this is a universe. Okay, so this was a symbol of uniformity, this cosmological principle. Um, here comes the multiverse. So here is, well, let's start with a balloon, which is like a football. Or let's be a little bit more imaginative, with a football with many different colors. So this part may be tiny, tiny, these may be tiny, they may have different properties. 
Let's take this ball and let us make it inflate. And it grows like that. And we live somewhere here. We look around 10 to the 28 centimeters. This is a part of what we can see. We look around and we see only blue universe. And we say, this is the universe, our universe. It, it is blue. It must be blue because of, let me try to find out the theory which uniquely predicts why the whole universe must be blue because that's what I am observing. That's what Einstein wanted. He wanted to have a theory which have a unique prediction. And the idea was that maybe, just maybe, all other predictions are simply mathematically inconsistent. Okay? So here is the other guy who lives here. He looks around, he sees around, only red universe, and he tries to come with a theory which explains unambiguously why the universe must be red, or black, or white. And instead of this, you have a different perspective, which I call cosmopolitan perspective. So you have, you have a possibility to live here and live here, or maybe you don't, because properties of realizations of laws of physics may be different in different parts. It's like water can be solid, can be liquid, can be vapor, but fish cannot live in the solid water. So even though it chemically it's the same, but for all practical consequences, it may be quite a lot of difference. That is why it is important to check whether our universe actually allows these possibilities. Also, another question is, what is like a primary idea? Because previously, because of these observations, which tell you that the universe is, well, everywhere the same, the basic idea was that the universe is uniform. So everybody had this like, uh, uh, like a basis to which to start with. Now that we tried to explain the uniformity, and we came so far with only solutions that we know is inflation, these only solutions that we know suggest that actually we do not have any experimental evidence saying that the universe is uniform anywhere. More or less, moreover, something else happened later. Suppose even that we have a uniform universe because it becomes uniform due to exponential expansion. Actually, this would be very bad because we do see galaxies. So we need somehow to produce them. Otherwise, you have perfectly polished universe and this will not be the universe where we can live. So we need to produce this inhomogeneity. Well, what happened quite unexpectedly, but it happened practically at the same time when inflationary cosmology was proposed. In fact, I would not be brave enough to propose my version of inflationary cosmology if I did not know that some people in our own institute, Chibisov and Muhanov, were working, suggesting totally crazy idea. You have quantum fluctuations everywhere in this room. We ignore them typically because they are very, very tiny. You need to know them if you want to calculate high energy collisions, quantum corrections to whatever processes. But on our human scale, uncertainty principle tells you that if you have lots of time, you look at the empty space and you see it empty. But if you have microscope and you have stroboscopic device, you look at what is happening there, vacuum is kind of boiling. It's still almost irrelevant, except for in the early universe during inflation. You take these tiny, tiny fluctuations, and then the universe blow up their size. If they are quantum fluctuations of electromagnetic field, for example, at the moment when the universe stretches it, the amplitude of the field shrinks. So nothing interesting. But if these are fluctuations of the scale of field, then because of this friction term, it expands, but the amplitude of the field does not shrink because of the friction, which freezes this amplitude. So you take the fluctuation, you expand the universe, and this fluctuation just spreads without losing its height. Then there are some other quantum fluctuations of larger frequency, which is very difficult to stop oscillating, but when they spread, away, when their wavelengths become sufficiently large, they also stop oscillating, and they freeze on the top of the previously frozen fluctuations. And then you continue it, and then other fluctuations freeze on the top of the previously frozen fluctuations, and what you get, you get an inhomogeneous distribution of the scalar field. In some places, 
energy of the scalar field will be large. In some other places, it will be small. These places where it is large, it will produce galaxies. These places where it is small will not produce galaxies. They will produce voids in between galaxies. Then it looks like, again, this science fiction. You are producing galaxies from quantum fluctuations. You want to double check it. So people double check it. They travel to Florida and they launch the satellites. And then they observe what is going on. And if they observe long enough and carefully enough, they see this. No, they do not do it that way. <laughs> they launch the satellites, really. Okay? So they see that actually this sky is not totally uniform. There is this remnants of the Big Bang with some tiny energy corresponding to the temperature 2.7 Kelvin, practically nothing, coming to our Earth from all sides of the sky, practically symmetrically. So you look at it, you get 2.7 Kelvin. You say, what is going on? People who discovered it in 64, 65, at first, they thought that this is something weird, probably the defect. They start checking, maybe it is a result of pigeon droppings on the <laughs> antenna. So they cleaned the antenna from these droppings. The effect was still there. OK, so they got Nobel Prizes for this cleaning. OK. <clears throat> now, much later, people studied it with greater accuracy. They found that this 2.7 Kelvin in this direction plus 10 to the minus 3 Kelvin. Very difficult to measure this temperature accurately. And in this direction, 10 to the minus 3, but the sign minus. So it's slightly less, slightly more. What is the reason? Who made this universe blue in this direction and red in this direction? So any suggestions? We did it. We did it by moving with respect to the universe. We experienced blue shift in this direction in which we are moving, and red shift when we are moving away from this background radiation which comes to us. So OK, subtract the speed of our Earth and our galaxy. Forget about this effect. Measure it with even better accuracy. And that is 10 to the minus 5 Kelvin. And then this is the result of the WMAP satellite which shown this map of sky. And now let's just think what they're showing. Well, they show something, these tiny spots. What are these spots? Well, inflationary theory tells you what it is. You have this fluctuating scalar field. And there are some places where the scalar field is heavier. Then it deforms metric of space depending on the amplitude of the fluctuations. These deformations are spread by expansion of the universe on this scale, which is largest of what we can see right now. So our space work as the largest ever photographic plate, which can be used for photographing quantum fluctuations, which were created at the time 10 to the minus 30 seconds after the Big Bang. Nothing can be more spectacular than that except for you can do it even better. So two weeks from now, Planck satellite is going to release their first well set of experimental data of this type, where they will make a photograph which is supposed to have even better resolution than what uh, this WMAP satellite produced. These are results of WMAP satellite together with several other experiments. And let me show you what it is here. People study distribution of these spots, whether there are many small spots or large spots, how many. So they characterize it by the function, which depend on the multiple momentum. So this part corresponds to fluctuations with large angle. These correspond to a very, very tiny angle. So uh, theoretical prediction of inflationary cosmology is this red line. And all of these spots are experimental results so far. So it is not necessarily saying that inflationary cosmology is right. Yes. <laughs> well, anyway, so there were lots of predictions of inflationary cosmology. I'm not going to do the propaganda part of my talk here. It just looks like 
uh, like a duck and quacks like a duck. But who knows? Maybe there are some bad ideas. For 30 years, people are trying to suggest bad ideas. So far, they are not better. Or at least, they do not seem better. It is not a no-go theorem. It's not saying that nothing like that can work and do better. We just do not know at the moment anything better than that. So let me summarize this part of my uh, talk with these transparencies, which are supposed to make uh, well um, uh, everything look simple. So here is what we uh, observe. We are sitting on the Earth. We are looking at the sky. And we are using these observations like space, sorry, like time machine. It's like when we are looking at the sun, we see the sun a few minutes ago. Not as it is now, but a few minutes ago. When we look at the stars, we look at them as they were years ago, thousands of years ago, millions of years ago. When we look at distant galaxies, then we see the galaxies, how they were formed perhaps two billion years ago or earlier. The earliest were created, well, not so far away from the time of the Big Bang. Now, we can move further observing this microwave ground radiation, which was produced approximately 400,000 years after the Big Bang. Why 400,000 years? Because radiation produced earlier. It was scattered so many times uh, in the dense plasma when it was produced. And then it's difficult to observe it. But at this moment, 400,000 years after the Big Bang, it becomes free, and you can observe what happened at this time. This is what WMAP observes. And we think that this is a Big Bang. This was the original idea, this fire created before. And that's the maximum we, we, what we can do. But when inflationary theory tells you that this is not the end of the story, if you push through this circle of fire, then you find, that's not me, okay, then you can find that the scale of field, there was no particles there. The universe is exponentially expanding. All particles which surround us, they were created after this field was oscillating here. So all of this fire that we observe right now is the circle of fire surrounding us. But the early times, there was no fire here. We were looking at this fire, and we thought that this is it. This is the beginning of the universe. But this was not a big bang. This was a bang, but it was not the big bang. It was not the beginning of the universe. And if we continue even further, we'll find the places where quantum fluctuations, which produce our galaxies, were so large that they were able to produce different parts of the universe. We are so large that they can throw the scalar field from one state to another. Another state where properties of particles are different from properties of elementary particles in our universe. So first of all, the universe which enters this regime becomes eternal. In some parts of the universe, this process of creation and recreation new parts continues even as we speak. And then during this process, all possibilities, like water can be liquid, water can be solid, water can be whatever, all of them are tested because of quantum fluctuations. You start with the red universe, you do not end in the red of the universe as my experimental result shows. Okay, I was born in Russia, see where I am now. So the same thing is valid for the universe, obviously. Now, the idea is that there is a genetic code in the universe, laws which may be represented differently in different parts of the universe. They may depend on scale of field, but in string theory, it's not necessarily scale field, it's something else. Uh, I better uh, go just jump for something to this part, which tells that recently we learned that in string theory, you just like in water, have three different states. In string theory, possibly, we have uh, this huge amount of states. And Michael Douglas, who calculated this number, of course, he would not take this number himself very seriously. Because who knows, maybe it's 10 to the 500. Maybe it is 10 to the 1,500. But it's just a huge number. So what inflation does together with this uh, mechanism, it allows our universe to be divided into different regions. 
in some of which uh, uh, the space have these properties. In some of them, it has totally different properties. So this changes our way of thinking about the universe. So what do we have? The uniformity of the universe, of our part of the world, is explained by inflation. But the same theory predicts, combined especially with string theory, predicts that at a very large scale, at exponentially large scale, the universe is 100% non-uniform. So inflationary universe actually becomes a multiverse in this sense. It's not like separate universes floating nobody knows where. It's the same universe with different countries in it, something that we observe here in the Earth. And that is bringing us to something which was universally despised by physicists everywhere because it was like too rotten philosophical that we live in a part of the universe where we can live which explains the properties of our universe. We are not explaining the properties of our universe. We are explaining properties of the part of the universe where we can live. On our Earth, we cannot live in the ocean, and nobody is surprised that this conference is not underwater, because there we would not be able to breathe. So it's just a correlation. So there is no metaphysics in it. It's physics as soon as you can provide exponentially large parts of the universe with different properties. And that's what seems we can achieve now. So self-reproducing universe looks like that. This was supposed to be a big bang starting from here. But we see different parts of the universe producing new universe due to large quantum fluctuations. This process continues forever, and the universe becomes multicolored. Instead of one cosmic balloon, it becomes a cosmic fractal. So this was the idea of Greek idea of beauty, something spherically symmetric. And that's what we see, spherically symmetric. We must explain spherical symmetry. Instead of explaining sem spherical symmetry, we were able to explain local uniformity. But then local uniformity comes together. This is like, goes like a free gift. You buy inflation. Here is a free gift for you. Multiverse in the same package. Does not cost you much. Big bang. Here we live. Here we live. We look at this part. We think that this is a big bang. But this is not a big bang. This is a pretty big bang, but not the big one. And now let me return to something. I just want to finish this on a very metaphysical note, just like a challenge. This is what we want. This is what we like. To say something totally confusing. Um, so this was uh, something which was told by Albert Einstein. The most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it's comprehensible. Actually, I never knew this citation. But I watched it. Bloomberg TV, for whatever reason. And there was Lisa Randall talking about the universe with extra dimensions and how it uh, allows us to think about physics differently. And she was beautiful, and she was smart. And the host of the program, he was kind of confused, but he was always asked very smart questions. So everything looked beautiful. And then in the end, when she was done, she said, but as Einstein said, the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. And she didn't know what to answer. Because if physicists know everything, but they do not know the first thing about the universe, why at all? Everything that they can talk about makes any sense whatsoever, why they can even think. So, what she, so she was confused, and this was ended like that. Oh. And I thought, my god, they still did not know that we have an answer. And then I decided to check what people are writing about this. Then I discovered this one. The unreasonable efficiency on mathematics, and I think that is quite a, appropriate in the environment of this institute. The unreasonable efficiency of mathematics and science is a gift that we neither understand nor deserve. So I thought, oh my, if Wigner says so, this must be serious. So Einstein kills kind of 
physics saying that in the end we are all stupid and this guy was happy to show her her place okay so now Wigner tells the same to mathematicians I thought oh my god so this was Wigner this was long ago so long ago what the present mathematicians are saying so I looked at it and I see what Gelfand say there is only one thing which is more unreasonable the unreasonable effective uh, mathematical speech this unreasonable ineffectiveness on mathematics. <laughs> <coughs> so I thought that this is a time when I must interfere. And this was also the time of 70th birthday of Stephen Hawking. So I decided uh, at least for the birthday party is uh, okay. So the reason why Einstein was puzzled about it and Wigner was puzzled about it is very simple. They had this vision that they have one universal mathematics, one universal physics describing everything that we see. And this physics, especially, I don't know about mathematics, but this physics must be such that allow us to explain everything and predict everything. So why is that, that God created the universe for computers which can calculate things correctly? Uh, is kind of very, very deep thought. And that's why they were puzzled, and that's why Wigner say like the gift of whom? Gift which we do not understand and do not even deserve. So this is self-humiliation with, I mean, this is just wrong, okay? So what I thought that in inflationary universe, this problem, well, either it disappears, or at least it should be reformulated. First of all, we should understand what is the essence of the problem. Uh, we must give an example of the universe where mathematics would be inefficient, for example. Or, yeah, okay, so here is an example. Suppose that among the stringy vacuum there are many where energy density is close to the Planckian density. At the Planckian density, all your rulers are, well, fluctuating like that, all your clocks are fluctuating like that. You cannot record anything. Any of your recording will be instantly destroyed and erased. So whatever th thoughts you might have, actually you will not have them because they will be instantly erased. You will not remember what happened when you open your eyes. Actually, your eyes will be destroyed instantly. <laughs> so there are places where this concept of efficient mathematics does not work. And the, uh, well, yeah, okay, so let's uh, give another example. Another example is the universe which is what so-called de Sitter space. De Sitter space is even low energy, but it just exponentially expands, it's totally, absolutely empty, and it cannot produce normal people. The only thing that it can produce some tiny fluctuations of whatever, which have very disoriented thoughts typically. They are called Boltzmann brains. So it is quite possible to think about parts of the universe where you cannot have coherent thoughts. You cannot even exist. Okay? So this becomes a physical question. Why do we live in the universe where, these, where mathematics is predictable? And the statement is the following. We can live only in those parts of the universe where the laws of mathematics and physics allow stable information processes and reliable predictions. Because after all, we won the game of evolution, or so we think. Okay? So we needed for that to have reliable predictions. People who got lots of money here at Renaissance they needed to have reliable predictions for the future. And that's why we gathered here around. So indeed, we live and we talk in the part of the universe where these mathematical predictions are, uh, well, coherent and possible and can be, can be used usefully. It does not mean that the whole universe is this way. So we live in the part of the universe where it is possible. Returning to my picture, this looks like that. Here, I don't know what. Here, maybe we have coherent thoughts. Here, well, somebody else can live, and I am not responsible for them. But there are some parts of the universe where physicists can live. And then they will look around and see we have a miracle 
that we can live and work in this part of the universe. And it will just mean that they live in the part of the multiverse where they live. So this problem, I do not say that it's actually totally removed by the emergence of this picture, but it at least should be formulated in a totally different way, and it is considerably relaxed, I believe. So this, on this picture, I'm going to finish this lecture, and thank you for your attention. Okay. Yeah, domain wall. Uh, it works like that. You have one energetically advantageous state, one vacuum. You have another energetically advantageous state. In the place where these two meet, there is a disadvantageous state, which, however, separates them. So you can go from one to another only if you have lots of energy to jump over the, uh, over the boundary. Okay? So this is like a domain wall. Now, domain, if the size of uh, these domains is exponentially large, as most probably so, then we're not going to see these domain walls unless, for whatever reason, uh, these bubbles have a large probability of being formed. People are playing with the idea that maybe the probability of vacuum decay is not so small. In this case, these bubbles can be produced reasonably close to us. You are not going to see one because it moves towards you with a speed approaching the speed of light. So at the moment when it hits you, this is the moment when you see it. And then you do not see it anymore. Okay? So there will be no reported evidence that I've seen, uh, yeah. But that is why many people apply to NSF grants for finding domain walls, because they will never have negative result reported. <laughs> okay. But they may have some indications if these bubbles are forming at the outskirts of the observable part of the universe, they may see some tiny inhomogeneities just well pointing in some direction, dangerous, maybe something coming. Okay, so yeah, th that, that's an area of research. It's very exotic. Uh, the probability of good, uh, good result in terms of observing is very, very small, and this is good news. <laughs> Other questions? Do you still require an original Big Bang, or could it have just gone on forever in the past as well? Oh. That's a tough one. So what we do, honestly, what we are doing is this. We are taking our data, and we use it like playing a movie back in time. Okay? So previously, we had right now 10 to the, uh, well, uh, more exactly, 13.7 billion years after, not after the Big Bang, after the end of the stage of inflation in our part of the universe. So we are running this. Uh, back in time, and what we previously were able to do, there was a famous book by Steven Weinberg, The First Three Minutes. Why did he say three minutes instead of seconds or milliseconds or whatever? Because at that time, people did not know what happened before. So what they did, they zoomed back to three minutes. This was the time when helium was born in our universe approximately. And it was difficult to know what happened before. So now what we learned is how to go to the time. Okay. We do not 100% know, but kind of we have an idea. That's why we call this scenario, not the full theory, because there are many versions of it. But in principle, we can go as close at approximately 10 to the minus 40, maybe, seconds. 10 to the minus 40. So we made the jump 40 orders of magnitude from what was at the Steven Weinberg's time when he was writing the book, and what we think now. Now, the last moments are the most complicated, because there, in order to study it in, well, and give uh, results which well, everybody would trust, you really need to know quantum gravity, supergravity, as some people here know much, much better than me. 
Maybe string theory, we are not yet there. We do not really have a reliable th theory. There are many ideas, some ideas that there was something before, it collapsed, and now it recollapsed. There are some other ideas that there was a quantum creation of the universe from nothing. What exactly nothing means? Uh, well, different interpretations. Okay, so there are ideas, but they did not yet create a totally convincing picture. Uh-huh. Good. Okay. So uh, I can even I can even uh, uh, ask this question in a more challenging form. I'm not sure that you're going to like the answer, but here here is how it goes. Um, usual picture of the Big Bang: it was nothing, and then everything. It does not really. Uh, uh, about inflation or any other theory. It's just about the theory of creation of the universe. So there's nothing and then everything. Okay? So now this everything is created in accordance with laws of quantum mechanics, electroweak interactions, whatever else. Okay? So how do we know laws? Well, we have some professors teaching you at the blackboard. They write equations on the blackboard. They say, this is the theory, and the behavior of the universe must obey the theory. But before the universe was born, there was no blackboards and professors. So in which sense theory existed? How can you talk about the law if this law cannot be ever written? Because there was no anything. Okay. Uh, another thing, well, suppose that, uh, so you have this dilemma. Either the universe was created totally lawless, all the laws existed before the universe. It just does not make any sense. Uh, quantum cosmology makes, well, once I say quantum cosmology, I already say quantum. So it's like quantum pre-existed the, okay. But I, I, I'm just saying that let us make another step, okay? So another step says this. You create a universe together with laws describing it, a pair, the universe and the laws and the observer in it, okay? Another one at some quantum level with its laws, with its set of observers, they all in a certain sense exist in this set of multiverses of more general type. What I was talking about was the primitive type of the multiverse, where you have a solid background like a sur surface of Earth, and it just separated into countries. Everything is intuitively seems clear. When I'm talking about different universes with different laws, it does not really make much sense. But it's the best sense that I can, well, the best way I can address this question. Usually we assuming that matter exists, but what about laws? Laws exist, but do they exist without being observed? Can they be observed without an observer? Does it make any sense to talk about our universe without thinking about observer? And I think not. I mean, I think that our existence is 100% important. There was this famous uh, paradox which was formulated by Bryce DeWitt in 67. It, it is very formal, but, the, uh, uh, all, but it's very general also. He have written uh, um, Friedman equation for the universe. Friedman equation looks like that. Derivative with respect to time of the wave function describing probabilities. And it is proportional to the Hamiltonian multiplied by a wave function of everything. Well, so he also in his paper, it was 67, he made an argument, or let's say shown, that the total Hamiltonian of the universe is equal to zero. The total energy of the universe is equal to zero being a sum of positive energy of matter and negative energy of gravity. So here we have equation d psi over dt 
is equal to zero, which means that the wave function of everything doesn't depend on time, which means that all these evolution which we observe right now, I, I, I'm sure that I am going to hurt my own reputation. But this is Bryce David, this is Bryce David. Okay. So um, all evolution that we observe does not make much sense because here is a theorem that the wave function predicting the evolution doesn't depend on time. So he answered this question saying, we never answer, ask a question why the universe depends on time uh, in disagreement with this theorem. We ask a question how the rest of the universe that we observe depend on time. So what you do, you divide the universe into two pieces, into observer or observers and the rest of the universe. And the total energy of observers plus the rest of the universe is equal to zero. But when you cut yourself, then the rest of the universe has energy equal to minus your mass multiplied by c squared. So the rest of the universe does have Hamiltonian. It does change uh, the wave function of the rest of the universe does have uh, evolution in time. You can answer some questions, but there is no evolution which is unobserved by an observer. But there is a, a theory called the conformal cyclic uh, cosmology. Uh, for example, the Edson Kangaroos had a paper. He said that uh, he found that there is some green shift uh, density uh, temperature fluctuation on the CMB. And he argues that that is left, that is produced uh, by the uh, black hole explosion before the before the current universe. Yeah. So we do. It's, so it seems that we do have the possibility that we can observe the universe before the current theory. So how do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, actually, Penrose doesn't have a theory. That's, that's the small, that, there's a quick answer to your question. He doesn't, he doesn't have a theory. He doesn't have a theory showing, really, not just in words, but showing how you can go through the singularity. And uh, what he said, well, acquire some popularity because it was used by some of uh, his co-authors uh, who say that this uh, leads to observational data. And Penrose by himself, he is a great mathematician. And I do not want to say anything bad about mathematics in this environment. But, but he stopped doing physics about 30 years ago. Uh, so uh, from time to time, he makes some statements. And some of his statements are actually incorrect. I learned it a hard way. I read his book, uh, this, uh, well, Emperor's, uh, whatever. Yeah, New Mind, OK? So I read the book. I've read the first chapter, which was about logic. And I found it fascinating, yeah, just so beautifully written. And then I came to the part of cosmology, and I started reading it. And I said, what he is writing? He just does not understand it at all. What is going on there? And then I find myself at Princeton in some place where whatever. Uh, there was some woman uh, who studied logic. And she asked me, what do I think about this book by Penrose? And I said, uh, yeah, this is a very, very good book. And it's uh, uh, perfect, uh, except for this part about cosmology was totally nonsensical. And she said, no, it was a part about logic that was nonsensical. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good question, or rather, a good answer to end on. Let's thank Professor Linda again. Thank you.